In today's video, I'm going to show you how you can take a simple plain mesh like this and add textures to it that will come out when you print. I'm going to show two examples, one a regular repeating pattern and another more rougher and randomized. Okay, let's get started. I'm going to make these mesh edits in a software called Sculpt GL. This is a free online alternative to things like ZBrush, and Blender. You can find the web link in the description below. When you first open the web page, you'll be presented with a sphere like this. So if you go to scene and clear scene, that will get rid of that. You can then go ahead, file and add the thing that you're hoping to edit. Your file will then of course be loaded. Now the first tool I'm going to point you in the direction of is the symmetry tool. Uh, you're gonna to want to make sure that's ticked if your model is the same on both sides because it will speed up your editing time as you'll only have to edit one side and the same will happen to the other side. If you go across to scene and then make sure that show mirror line is ticked, you'll see where that mirror line is presented. And that mirror line shows that anything you do on one side will then be repeated on the other side. As you can see from this drag operation, something on one side is repeated on the other side. But of course, for this model, that mirror line is in the wrong place and we actually need it to run 90 degrees to the current mirror line. As such, we're going to want to rotate the model. Now, Sculpt GL isn't great for rotating models because it doesn't have a fixed axis, so I've gone back into Simplify 3D, my slicer, to perform the rotation. If, when you import your model into Sculpt GL, you find that the mirror line isn't in the logical place, you can go back to your slicer to rotate your model like I'm doing here, or do it in the original software in which you modeled the part. Once you've gone ahead and exported it, you can then re-import it into SculptGL and double check that the mirror line, of course, runs through it as you would logically expect. Perfect. And just to show you that that now works exactly as expected, I'll do another drag operation, and pull something out the side, and there we go. What I did on the one side is repeated on the other side. Just a handy tip here, Control Z, like in most software, is the undo function and control Y is the redo. Right, now what we're going to do is have a look at the underlying wireframe of the model. And you can do that by pressing W on your keyboard. You'll see that the model at the moment is very triangulated. The curved sections have more triangles, but some of the flat sections are very, very barren. For sculpting software like this, we need a more even spread of triangles to make sure that we can add a detail and control the mesh as we need to. So we're going to need to perform some remeshing. If you go to the topology section in the top right and you look at the resolution adjuster, you'll see that when you adjust the resolution and click remesh, it generates a number of triangles. Low resolution, fewer triangles, or high resolution, loads of triangles. For this project, I'll probably need something in between but don't worry too much because you can always add detail at a later stage. It's better to err on the side of caution and go low resolution so that your model is not too large. Play around with the slider and the remesh button until you get something which is fairly low resolution but doesn't result in any loss of detail to your model. That's about perfect for mine. The next step is to select the section of the part we want to add the texture to. Go to Sculpting and Painting, then use the drop down to select the Masking tool. You can think of this as adding masking tape before painting to protect a certain part of the model. I like to start with a large radius and I'll set the hardness to 100 so that you're completely blocking out all of the triangles. Again, symmetry tool comes in very handy here. Once you've got the bulk done, you can lower the radius and paint in some more of that detail. As with most things, preparation is very important. So take your time here to cleanly draw out the section where you want to apply a texture. Once you've done an edge, you can then lower off the hardness and think of this as the opacity tool adding a softer line to the edge. I sped through this process as of course it took a little while.
Once you're happy that you've properly masked out the section for the texture, you can double check the other side to make sure the symmetry tool has worked as it should. And then what we actually are going to do is flip this mask with invert, as this then makes the marked section workable and protects the rest of the model that we don't want to apply the texture to. Now we can use the drop down to switch across to the brush tool. In sculpting, a brush tool adds material like so. You could of course add texture just by painting it on yourself, but we're going to use alphas, which will dramatically speed up the process. So under the alpha section, we have texture and then import alpha. I'm going to be using this one here, which is a metal alpha I found on Google. Because SculptGL is a bit limited with its alpha functionality, I use Photoshop to tile the alpha across and create a giant lattice structure, which could be applied with one brush stroke. If you leave the settings as they are and just brush across, it will look pretty similar to the original brush functionality. So we're going to need to edit some of those settings to get the best from it. If you click lock position, it gives you much more control over how the alpha is applied. You can then click on the model, drag outwards to adjust the horizontal size and the vertical size is adjusted with the intensity. Since we only want a light texture, we can lower the intensity right down. Also going to increase the radius a bit, just because that starts the texture smaller on the model. In the same way, we start, drag across, and you can see the texture starting to come out better. One thing you'll notice here is the texture added is not very detailed. Now this comes back to the level of triangulation in the model that I talked about earlier. So we're going to need to add some more triangles to our texture section so that the texture can be applied with more detail. I found a good way of doing this using the inflate tool. Change the tool to inflate, reduce the intensity right down. Then in the topology menu, make sure that dynamic topology is activated. You can then use the inflate tool to paint over your model. You might find at first nothing happens, if that is the case, reduce the radius a bit of your tool. Always keep the intensity of the inflate tool very low. I like to use one because this ensures that the model isn't actually inflating. It's just extra detail added. Once you've got all that set, you can then paint across and more triangles should start to appear like this. If that's not worked for you, then make sure the subdivision section under dynamic topology is turned up as high as it will go. We can now close the topology section and go back to the brush tool. Now I'll pause the video here to explain some of the settings. Starting from the cursor, you'll see I've got thin surface selected. This ensures that only the vertex we are looking at, only the triangles that we see in front of us are edited and not the ones in behind. This is quite important because otherwise you can lose the detail in the mesh and not really understand why. The accumulate option is more applicable if you are using the brush like a brush and moving it around rather than the lock position method we're doing here for this fixed texture. It effectively acts similar to intensity. In this scenario, the clay option affects whether the texture itself is coming out of the model or being pressed into it. I've left it off as I want it, the texture to indent into the model. The negative works in a similar sort of way, apart from it affects the brush, not the texture. So does the brush push into the model if it's ticked negative or out if it's left unchecked. If the wrong section of your texture is showing up on the model, as in the black rather than the white or the white rather than the black, then change the clay option to the opposite. Okay, back to work. I'll select an area in the middle of the model and pull outwards. The distance my mouse is from that center point controls the size and intensity of the texture applied. And the angle my mouse is from that center point affects the rotation of the texture itself. 
you'll find this is a little bit hit and miss. You have to play around. You might have to zoom out a bit to make sure that you can pull your mouse far enough away from the model to get it the right size. And again, that control Z functionality, the undo, comes in very handy here as you experiment to get the best settings for your part. You'll find the texture is applied strongest at the same angle where you click. On the sides, it tapers off a bit. So for this one, I've decided to put a texture on the front and also again overlap it on the side. You could play around to get the alignment perfect, but I'm trying to keep this video reasonably quick. And voila, there you have it, the repeating pattern texture. You can then go to file and save in whatever format you want. I'm using STL. Okay, undo, undo. It's time to do the more random texture. This time we're gonna change the texture to skin. That's a built-in one in SculptGL. We're then going to want to change a few of the settings as we'll apply this in a slightly different way. I'll whack the intensity up, reduce the radius, and then apply it in sections. Although I'm gonna turn the lock position off so I can treat it like a brush and paint across the surface. As you see, where I paint, the texture comes out of the model more. If you do it too much, it actually creates a bulge and obviously that's not what we want. To prevent it being quite so easy to bulge out like that, I'm going to increase the radius and drop the intensity down. Then I can just use more strokes to brush across the model and add the extra bumpiness where I want it. As I click and move around the model, you'll see that the texture starts to build up. I can then continually add more in the bolder sections until it has a nice even coating of texture. This will make a perfect randomized grip. As I've mentioned before, the undo control Z function is your friend. So don't be scared to experiment because you can always undo it if you add too much. That looks good, happy with that. So I will now go ahead and export the model. Once again, file, save as whatever format you want. Again, I've chosen STL. Right, just to show I have done as promised, I'll import those two that I've just modeled there. The repeating pattern one and the randomized texture one. And aligning them in front of the ones I showed you at the start of this video, you can see how I have indeed recreated those types of models. I appreciate this was quite a tricky, challenging video to follow. So if you need to rewatch sections, don't be afraid to do so. If you'd like to see them printed out, then let me know. And uh, I can always post them over on the 3D Tomorrow Instagram. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, just drop them down below and I'll be happy to help. And yeah, happy practicing in SculptGL. Let me know what you create. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you next time. Cheers.